Deep Space Nine is the Star Trek with the greatest focus on political concepts like colonialism, feminism, queerness, and post-scarcity economics. Join hosts and guests who aren't just Trekkies, but activists, academics, artists, therapists, and more as we take a deep dive into the text and subtext where few Star Trek podcasts have gone before. We'll be discussing Deep Space Nine's themes and characters. Unlike many other podcasts that go episode by episode, we are not doing recaps. As a result, every every episode of Deep Space Dive is full of spoilers. If you are still watching the show for the first time, we recommend finishing your binge and then going back into our archives. They'll all be there waiting for you. Welcome to Deep Space Dive. I'm Elon Eleven also the host of Graphic Policy Radio. I've worked at the intersection of comics, nerd culture, and social change for over a decade. My biggest Trek cred is I gave a speech on fan activism at a rally organized by Lita, aka Chase Masterson, wonderful activist that she is. And I'm Sarah Daniel Rasher. When I'm not getting paid to use math to save the world, I write about film and figure skating. I was the founding captain of my high school Star Trek club, and I once got Nicole DeBoer to kiss me at a convention. Ooh. Today, instead of talking about a character or a theme, we're talking about one of Deep Space Nine's signature settings, the Mirror Universe. It's hard to believe there are only five Deep Space Nine Mirror Universe episodes because DS9 transformed the original series' one-off concept into a fleshed-out alternate reality with its own politics, history, and in-jokes. The Mirror Universe divides DS9 fans, with some loving the campy, queer-tinted diversion from the main plot, and others hating it for the same reasons. Nonetheless, it's popular enough to have spawned arcs on several subsequent series, a ton of tie-in novels, and some of my favorite Trek comics. Join us as we recalibrate the transporter polarity for a journey through the looking glass. (laughs) I love that intro. I'm so excited to be doing this with you. It gave me an excuse to rewatch some of those episodes, and um, it's been good to reconnect with that material. Yeah, I'd never actually done like a mini binge of just all of the Mirror Universe episodes right in a row. And it really does come off differently than like just letting them roll around watching the whole series. One of the questions we actually got from listeners was, does the arc build up to something? Is there a plot there? And before doing it in preparation for this um, podcast, I would have said, I don't know. But like, I'm now fairly convinced that there's something that moves through the five episodes that's meaningful. Oh, absolutely. Do we want to do this one right now? I mean, I, we were going to start just talking about the appeal of it in general, clearly on the side of like, I love these stupid things. Like they're not all good episodes, but I really enjoy the mirror universe in general. Are you also on that page or are you a little more mixed? Oh, I really enjoy it. I mean, I liked it from the start and I think partially it was just like, oh my gosh, let's go watch Kara be incredibly queer and campy. It gives so many wonderful, delightful, scenery-chewing things for our cast to do. Um, You know, remember, folks, like, DS9 is my trek. I didn't come up watching the original series or TNG. I was aware of Mirror Universe stuff because pop culture makes so many jokes about, like, you know, evil Spock has a beard or whether or not someone has a beard is how you can tell if they're a Mirror Universe version of themselves, etc. Um, And so I was aware of the concept, but uh, I was always really on board for it. Yeah. And I'm just to put this up front, um, I'm kind of a mirror universe fan just beyond the realm of Deep Space Nine. Mm. Like I realized because it's season four of Enterprise. And at the time I was like starting a master's degree that I had never seen the Enterprise two-parter and oh boy, do I never have to watch that that thing again <laughs> but recently for another project alana asked a bunch of their friends um what our favorite comic book special events of all time were and i was like 2017 star trek mirror universe anybody anybody but me i've read a bunch of the um, trek novels that are set in the mirror universe there's a whole series of those of varying quality um so like i'm really fond of the concept in general Although I feel very strongly that other than the wonderful 2017 uh, miniseries, comics miniseries, which people should go read, um, that Deep Space Nine by far does it the best. Yeah, yeah. 
which is really exciting. One of my favorite comics writers these days, my friend Danny Lore, just wrote a Star Trek Deep Space Mirror War one-off issue that's really centered around Cisco um, that just came out. It looks super good. It's called Star Trek The Mirror War, colon, Cisco. And folks should definitely buy that so then there can be more of it because that's how these things go. You, you purchase them and, and, then, and then they make more of them for us. Um, the artist is Hen- Hendry Prasetya. And I know like Danny is a huge DS9 person and I know how much this meant to them to make the comic. So just in general and, and just in general, like we are fans of the, on uh, the sort of various Star Trek comic series and tend to think that they do a good job. Um, so yeah, like, Read the comics. We don't really talk about them here, but the comics are great if you need more track. And who doesn't? Really? So, like, in general, like, what appeals to us about those Mirror Universe episodes? You know, I, I go back and forth about whether I not hy- whether I'm into hypothetical other worlds. Like, I think that when I got into this, um, it didn't feel like it was a trope that was as played out as it's become. And so the core concept of you know, what if it's these people that you love, but there's been some subtle changes in the timeline and the world went a very different way. And this is what they could be like or how they could operate in another space, you know, was, it felt extremely novel. Um, you know, I wasn't a DC c- comics reader really at the time that I began watching Trek. So I didn't have like earth one and earth two and else worlds and all that other stuff kind of sitting in my mind in the same way. And, um, you know, now it feels like everything has got a, alternate universe and like i really struggled to have any interest at all in the fucking heinous ass animation of the what if series that marvel animated did for example um granted if it was prettier i would i would have kept up with it but um but this this was still really novel when they were doing it and i just think that it letting people letting the actors have so much fun being their bad selves like you can tell how much fun they're having and it let and it lets and the mirror universe lets them get away with things that they can't get away with when it's really canon. And that's especially with queerness. And that's been true of comics as well, right? Like in one of the popular comics multiverse worlds of Marvel, Wolverine and um what's his name? Uh is it Hercules? I think that they're like in love and they're like the and they like run Australia. And you know, so Logan can be explicitly canonically queer as opposed to like i mean right now like we all know he's literally leaving living with scott summers and gene in a thruple but the comic still has to kind of like can't like show them kissing on panel they can kiss on panel in an alternate universe in marvel and similarly in the 90s you know kira could be more expressively bisexual and queer um in a mirror universe because it doesn't quote unquote count yeah i think that it's even to the point where most fans now accept that Kira must be bisexual because Mirror Kira is bisexual, right. um, which is something I think that we'll get into later in a variety of ways. But yeah, for me, watching that first Mirror Universe episode when I was like, it was like fairly early in high school, just seeing that and going, wow, first of all, they are putting that on my television. And second of mm. all, like, uh, just being a, s- feeling like there was a freedom in seeing that. And there's also just, it's goofy. Like there's something just incredibly charming and goofy and unhinged about it. And I feel like one of the reasons some of the later TV shows that have played with the mirror universe have been less successful is because they haven't leaned into the goofiness of it. Whereas mm-hmm. on deep space nine, it was pure, like, just letting the actors off their leashes. Everybody's completely unhinged. Occasionally putting the actors on their leashes. Literally. Literally (laughs) on their leashes. Um, Like, you know, just there's something incredibly freeing and exciting about that. And it's also at the time when I was watching these for the first time as a teenager, I was also getting into things like Philip K. Dick and Kurt Vonnegut and stuff that had that sort of like um, multiple universes, multiple possibilities, 
trippiness to them. So it was just sort of something that I was discovering as a literary possibility. And even though it wasn't the only thing playing with that idea at the time, it certainly felt much fresher at the time than it does now when like everything has to have the AU episode, like sitcoms have to mm-hmm. and stuff. Yeah. Like it's now become a little bit of a tired trope, but when the show was airing, it was still a fairly fresh trope. It just got used in some interesting ways that they not only did they use it to explore some of the possibilities of the characters, but frequently it was used to tie up some loose ends in various ways that they couldn't because they had killed somebody off. Right. Right. Yeah. One of our uh, listeners noted that it is one of the few things that Trek returns to over and over, that it's become just sort of like a cult thing that Trek fans love. And part of that, part of the reason for that, I think, is just that it's it's so common to have an alternate universe episode or plot line, um, just in genre TV and even in non-genre TV in the year 2022. But why else do you think it's really held up as a thing that Trek fans get excited about? More beards and more gayness. <laughs> I like truly. It actually made me think about the, it, did Star Trek invented the mirror universe or did DC have the third world at that point in time? Certainly there were sci-fi and fantasy authors playing with this kind of thing before Trek got to it. So DC comics began having essentially their own mirror universe, which was earth three home of the crime syndicate where Superman is Ultraman and Batman is Owlman, and it's like a fascist evil version of the DC universe. That began in 1964. So that predates the Star Trek mirror universe by like two years. Like there's clearly something about it being that point in the 60s that just demands mirror universes. Yeah, there was a lot in the 60s and 70s of especially World War II alternate histories and that kind of thing. So I think that it was just sort of floating in the ether in that period of time. Um, But a lot of it was much more sort of alternate history oriented. Um, And then it's only really been in the past, I'd say, like 15 or 20 years that it's gone from like a literary and comics thing to a thing in all of media. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, people have that desire for like what happens if the fork, if the fork in the road had gone a different way, or what does the opposite of themselves seem like? I am one of my RPG characters that I have enjoyed playing a great deal. A friend of ours pointed out to me that, like, when I was explaining him to someone who was joining our game, he was like, and Ilana is playing the opposite of Ilana. And I just had this moment of like, oh, I guess that is what I did. And I didn't sit there designing him on purpose to be the anti-me, but that is what I made. I think there's something appealing about seeing something that is like the opposite of how you see yourself and what that would play out with in the world. Um, And it's fun to be able to be a complete fucking bastard too. There's also just the sense of like how do you transform a character into a very different set of circumstances and values while still making them recognizably themselves? Mm -hmm, And mm -hmm. like one of the reasons I think that the original series episode worked, the the reason why um, Deep Space Nine worked and the reason why the comics worked um, and why some others have struggled a little more is the best Trek examples really lean into like Let's make sure that these characters are always recognizably who we know them as. Mm. But just so transformed by their circumstances that they're very different people while still holding on to that sort of like central sense of who we know them to be. And I think that that 
as, you know, as we do our sort of own navel gazing about like, what are the turning points in my life? Who would I have been if X, Y, Z had happened? Mm -hmm. Who would my family be? What makes me me? I think it really gets us into those questions. I have a question for you. Are the Mirror Universe episodes in the other series, are they campier than most? I mean, I imagine the original series is just all camp all the time anyway. So those must be campy. So I did not rewatch Mirror Mirror for this. I probably should have, but you know, one only has so much time in the day. Um, Mm -hmm. And I spent two hours of it watching Enterprise. So Mirror Mirror is super campy, but a lot of what's campy about it is just that it has such a cultural footprint. So like all the stuff about like Spock's beard, um, like it's campy because it's become a thing. Um, It actually makes some really nice very like 60s progressive points about Mm -hmm. how about like the first step towards peace being like people objecting to this to the status quo of violence like it's campy but it also has quite a bit of depth to it it's kind of a lovely episode Mm. um and um the end enterprise two two two-parter is incredibly campy but it's unintentional camp Got it. It's well, camp. You know, yeah. li- it's camp like um, a RuPaul's Drag Race acting challenge where everybody is just saying everything very loudly. <laughs> but um, you know, it made me think about like how much in the episode in the DS Nine episodes um, they talk about the what the impact the crossing over had in the Mirror Universe um, as the political impact that Kirk had on their universe. And it's like, on the one hand, it's presenting this very much like great man shapes the world theory of history that we look at as being both regressive and inaccurate, but it is pointing to um, what he imparted on be as being, yeah, as a pacifist message. And I think, you know, with that question somebody posed about like, is there an overall plot or narrative coming from the mirror universe episodes for, DS9, absolutely. It's all about the question of like, it's it's paralleling the story of the Bajoran liberation. It's just like from the perspective of the Terrans now and like what, you know, whether violence is justified, uh, what do you do in the face of state-based oppression? Um, what kind of risks are appropriate to take to fight for freedom? So it absolutely is paralleling the dominant, like the story of the Bajorans. Or as, and as it, one of the fascinating yeah. things is that the original series episode ends on this really hopeful note of revolution. And then what Deep Space Nine shows is this 100 or 150 years later, like that hopeful mentality has just degenerated into even greater chaos. Um, and that's both incredibly pessimistic but also the fact that then the subsequent arc is how do these people get it right this get it right on the second try if that makes sense Mm. like the first attempt at revolution just got them all oppressed but the second attempt it seems like by the end of the mirror universe arc it looks like things are going to be better Mm-hmm. Or at least there is a sense of it. And we actually haven't seen on screen any of the Mirror Universe post Deep Space Nine. Um, because both Enterprise and Discovery Appreciate take it. place yeah. in between the original series and Deep Space Nine. And one of the reasons, just to like be complete about it, um, one of the reasons I find the Discovery arc unsatisfying even though there are parts of it like Tilly's hair that are like perfect. (laughs) Um, There are like great moments, but it just goes on forever and takes itself really seriously and is really like afraid of the camp aspect of it in a way that like Deep Space Nine absolutely just like takes a bath in. Yeah. Yeah. I still hold though. The reason I knew that, Jason Isaac's character was mirror universe is because he had a bad dye job and um, that was a sign of vanity. Da, yeah. da, da. Anyway, because I, I could tell he had a bad dye job anyway. Um, 
Yeah, I you know I, just, I think it's interesting because like I said, like, yeah, Sam Guido's question was very much like you know people seem to think that the purpose of those episodes in DS9 was to have was to be a break to break up the Dominion War arc and like I you know it definitely functioned like that as a way to give people a breather but I think it is asking you to look at the world um, and imagine how it would be if humans were the ones who were uh, being enslaved basically yeah and it also like i feel like there are good episodes of deep space nine that directly show you the history of the cardassian occupation of major yes Um, but there's a lot that are really plotting or uncomfortable or haven't aged well or are just like trying too hard and i feel like and this is where i note that my wife last night Amy, Amy, who's like, you're going to mention me, right? You're going to mention this stuff. So hi, Amy, um, Hmm. was talking a lot about and saying really insightful things about how Deep Space Nine does a better job of showing what the occupation was like in the Mirror Universe episodes Hmm. than it does when it actually tries to show what the occupation was like. That's so true. That's so real. Um, I mean, one of the things I want to know your thoughts about is um, they have all the Terrans are like wearing this badge that is what, that is an image of the planet earth, including um, Cisco's wife, professor Cisco, who's like, you know, a collaborator with the oppressors. Um, And so I think we're to take those to be like some form of like Yudin badges that they're forced to wear to demonstrate that they're Terran. Is that how you read those? Yeah. I mean, I always am, inclined to read specifically Cardassia and Bajor. Bajor is having more in common with like the British Raj, um, where also there yep. would be, <laughs> you know, like physical signifiers of people's status and, you know, apartheid South Africa and things like that. But mm, we know that the Holocaust is not the best comparison for this, but most of the people creating this material don't. Um, and I think that if they're using an, a logo. Yeah. Um, no, what that I was going to say, yeah. this is one of the few places where I feel like that comparison holds up. And I feel like, especially like the scenes in Quarks in the first Mirror Universe episode crossover. Mm-hmm. Um, have this very like Casablanca feel to them. Yeah. And Deep Space Nine goes to the Casablanca well a few times. I feel like that could be another episode of Deep Space Dive. Uh, is just like Quark as Humphrey Bogart. <laughs> but yeah, it's one of the places where the World War II and Holocaust comparisons actually do hold up and i think a lot of it is because so much of the near universe focuses on the sort of banality of living in this universe that's interesting yeah yeah i think that's likely why this is a track trope that fits right into deep space nine and maybe doesn't work as well in some of the others just because like deep space nine both is really excited to be campy, but also is engaging with questions of occupation and colonialism and oppression and race-based and ethnicity-based oppression Mm. in ways that most of the other Trek series are not as successful in addressing. Yeah. Like they were smart enough to just never put it on next generation or Voyager where I believe strongly that even though the comic books and the novel tie-ins have actually done some cool things with next generation and um, Voyager characters in the mirror universe. um, Like I think on the shows themselves, it just would have been very confused. Duly noted. Are the Mirror Universe characters really the opposite of their prime counterparts? Are they the same people or are they the same people with different life experiences? I think there's a consistency problem and it depends Mm -hmm. on who was writing what and which actor got which set of notes. Yeah. Or what the story needed to have them be. Yeah. So we get 
Like, I feel like the running joke of of the Ferengi is you keep meeting Ferengi who are the opposite of themselves and then they get shot. <laughs> like, you meet Quark and he's very nice and very noble and then he dies. And you meet Nog and although Nog, it's basically like Nog as a prick without any of Nog's redeeming qualities and right. then he dies. Like, oh, Aaron Eisenberg is having such a fun time in that. I, I, I'm i having fun for him watching him. I, you know what? Like, almost everybody who gets to be in the Mirror of Universe is just having a blast the entire uh, entire time. Like, yeah. just the jo- pure animal joy in Michael Dorn's eyes every time he gets to be Mirror Wharf. It's like... Oh, God, right? Yeah. And we love yeah, it. Yeah, but, like, Aaron Eisenberg is spectacular i feel like honestly i don't love the the seventh season one but i do love nicole de being like i can't believe i get to do this no nicole de with joan jet hair is yes is that actually is probably what made me finally like her to be honest wow the wigs though the, just the wigs. oh yes so do i hate bashir's character in this because his wig is so bad yes or is he just that he's irritating yes i mean or is it both all of these all of these um i feel like bashir is one that they didn't quite know what to do with him um like he's fun but i don't even think he's fun i think he's the worst i think to me i think he's the only mirror universe character that i don't enjoy at all like even when he has this Han Solo kind of moment with Dax in the uh, and the when they come back in the third Mirror Universe episode and they like help the ship escape, I I don't enjoy him at all and I I do kind of think that I don't enjoy him being a miserable bastard. Maybe it's part of it and yeah. and his wig is just not doing anyone any favors. I feel like a lot of the things that they could have done with Bashir they would not have been allowed to do on 90s television because let's face it, what we really want from Mira Bashir is deeply neurodivergent space pirate fucking Garrick for information. Mm. There is no way we were going to get that in the 90s. So yeah, but like also if he's a good, if he's with the good guys, he's not going to be fucking Garrick, Mirror Universe Garrick. Well, you know, but we want that anyway. Um, True. We all want that at all times. Um, I just think but- like they could have had him... You know, I didn't think about what an alternate for him would have been that I would have enjoyed more. But I just think that there are some actors who really enjoy being a miserable bastard and make you enjoy watching them be that way. And he's just not one of them. I don't enjoy him that way. No, that's what I'm saying. Like, I wanted to you you want to see them lean into the the queer on that one, certainly. And also into the just like arrogant and no social skills and that sort of thing Mm. what kind of person would that be in a society that has no supports for somebody who just has no innate social skills Mm. and wouldn't have had any cushion for him on it by his parents being like you're gonna go to school and learn and then you'll be fine yeah yeah and it is actually i have a whole list of like the fridge logic problems and it's like is Mirror Bashir genetically altered? Did that also happen in this? So I think we're sort of pointing out where there are consistency problems, but I feel the characters that work, it's very, very clear that they are the same person. They've just been shaped by trauma and or privilege to become very different people. I So here's the thing. Kira is being Ducat, right? I really think so. And I I don't see that as being an inclination within Kira at all. Like, I, I really enjoy her as Ducat because I think it's an incredibly fun performance and it serves as a useful commentary to say that that this kind of, like, sexualized tyranny and objectification like what that would like look like coming from her. And um, I think it's, it's, it's uncomfortable in a, in, in, in a, in a way that is really magnetic, but I don't think that if it was really Kira, I just don't see any world where Kira becomes Garrick. 
I, I think it's that's more of a commentary about the fact that Bajorans are not inherently good rather than it being about Kira as a particular person. I think you slipped and said you don't see a, a, a future where Kira becomes Garrick when you meant Dukat. But like that's even funnier. But like but like I think that, that makes makes your point Sorry. even more clearly. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Right. I, right. I'm saying like, I don't see a version of the world. I don't see a version of the world in which any circumstance would make a person who is Kira internally become Dukat. That's just that's just so the opposite of her values in any way. But I think that it's useful as a way of showing um, that the Bajorans are as capable of becoming, you know, are capable of becoming oppressors who are exoticizing the humans who they, you know, who they conquered and that it's not like they're inherently good. Yeah. I am totally inclined to agree with you, except that again, again, I get to like credit Amy for this a bit, but we were really talking yesterday about how, um, one of the things that's really fascinating about Kira is that she has the, she responds to being a free person after decades of not being free by taking a lot of pleasure in everyday things. And it's like, what if that's something that would have been excessive if it had only ever been encouraged and she just had been a really decadent person because she had never known hardship. She had never known moderation. Um, and the, the idea of Mira Kira as this just total unfettered decadent is what happens to somebody who's just so unaware of their own privilege that they're just off the rails. And like, I think that it, it becomes an interesting way to read Kira as somebody who is shaped by her circumstance so that a lot of her worst qualities were sort of traumatized out of her in kind of a horrible way. I still don't think there's any way that our Kira would, be at the levels that we're seeing. I mean, one of the things that is so interesting with the intendant is how she's so manipulative all the time um, in ways that are very, very obvious most of the time, which means that when she's being manipulative in more subtle ways, she actually gets away with it. It's like, it's like she's concealing the hidden viper inside like a larger wolf or something like that. So everybody thinks that because they see her being emotionally manipulative, then they can be on the watch out and not let, and not let her get to them. But then there's this whole other level inside it that they're not seeing because of the bigger performance. Um, and like, you know, if she she wants to be like seen as just this like pure sensualist, but she really is actually invested in maintaining her power. She just understands that sometimes like sex potting it up is going to be more effective for getting that in the end. Yeah, I, I'm yeah. torn between the sort of incoherence of the of the intended to the side of you know Prime Kira and the other side. Thinking of things like the number of times Kira actually does use sex for power, and she's not even thinking of it that way, but she does, you know, go date the first minister and things like that. I agree with you that, like, it doesn't totally cohere, but there are a lot of interesting resonances there. I just think it's so powerful, though, that, and also just her outfit is important, also. It's a great look. She gets a little crown thing. Who else doesn't want a little crown thing? It's like a circlet. Yeah. One of my favorite moments that I had not really noticed before is when um, Nog breaks her out of a holding cell in DS9 and she's going to get off the planet. And she just mentions in passing that she's going to go to Bajor. And he's like, this is so great that, you know, you're going to owe me a favor and I would never betray you. And you can see on her face her realizing that it's her fault that she's going to have to kill Nog because she told him where she was going. And if she hadn't told him where she was going, she wouldn't have had to kill him. And you can see this moment on her face of being like, oh, oh that, that's, that fuck up's on my part. What a shame. And then shoots him. You know, like there's that moment of guilt. Yeah. It's a very Breaking Bad moment. 
Oh, interesting. I haven't seen Breaking Bad, but that's, yeah. But she's realizing she's, she, that it's her fault that she's going to have to kill Nog. Because yeah. if she didn't tell Nog she was going to Bajor, she wouldn't have to shoot him. Yeah. Kira, Kira. Yeah. And Kira is interested because for, on the one hand, she's like the signature character of the Mirror Universe on DS9. And they, on the other hand, most of the other characters do sort of fit into a pattern of like, this is who this person would be if they either had a history of trauma or a history of less trauma. So like, like Smiley O'Brien is who O'Brien would be if he'd been, mm -hmm. if he'd spent his life enslaved. Yeah. No, he's the one that's the most like, yep, that's you. Yeah. But I also feel that about like Cisco that like Cisco the mirror Cisco is like just all of the coping mechanisms that that character needs to go on being this like natural leader and this person mm. who really has a strong moral compass, but just needs to not care about any of that because he's so busy surviving. Yeah. Tell me more. Cause mirror Cisco, when I first saw mirror Cisco, my brain was like, what the fuck? Like I could imagine Kira being this campy villain a lot more easily than I could imagine Cisco being this like, a moral pirate dude um but it's an amazing performance and i feel like now upon further reflection i'm trying to understand it in a deeper way so yeah tell me more about why you feel like yeah. he makes sense well we only get to see him once and he's only in a few scenes we barely see him before he dies but when i think about like so prime cisco our cisco's trauma is Later in life, like he loses his wife, he, ex you know, he's got basically PTSD. So he's already formed like this entire sense of his own identity and his own strengths. And he lives in a Starfleet universe that rewards those strengths. Whereas in a, a universe that is telling him all the time that he's less than others and that he shouldn't speak up and that he's going to get pu punished if he speaks up. He should never lead. He should never do anything independently. And I think that Avery Brooks, if anybody is going to be credited with recognizing how oppression shapes the psyche of very competent people, that you get a lot of people who become outlaws in various senses because their sense of self is so strong that the only way to continue being themselves is to take this sort of pride in being an outlaw. But he had to have gotten Kira's approval in some way in order for her to be like, here's a ship, go be pirating it up. So he must have had something going on that attracted her attention yeah. you know well he's just i mean one of cisco's strengths is that he he is very manipulative he is very charismatic and sometimes uses that like you think of like the in the pale moonlight mm -hmm. moment that like he has that capability and you just think of this as somebody who that's his dominant mode. That's all he's been doing his entire life is deceiving people and charming them in order to, sur to survive. One of the things that's so good with his performance okay. when he's playing mirror Cisco is that sadness. That's like right under the surface. Yeah. It's like uh, right underneath the swagger is the sadness. Yeah. I think one of the places where it does work well, and I have very mixed feelings about um, Resurrection, which is the one where Mira Burial shows up. Mm -hmm. I think it's one of the characters that they do the best job of using trauma to describe what would be different about somebody in the Mirror Universe. That mm -hmm. like it really just keeps going back to Burial's psychology and his looking around and saying, wow, if I'd lived a different life, I would have been a religious leader and not a, not a thief. But mm -hmm. at the same time, like there's this thing looming that we're like, 
Yeah, but you would have had to live 30 years under Cardassian occupation. In order to be that better person, you would have had to go through so much. Um, yeah. But that he's grieving this person that he had the potential to be. And I feel like that's the coherence we want from the mirror universe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, definitely. And what an interesting choice it was for the series to pull him out from storage to do that with. Like I've, you know, I've always found the character interesting and appreciated him. I know he has a lot of people who don't care, but I love a Bajoran politics episode and, he comes along with those. And I've realized that the fact that I enjoy him was one of the reasons why I do like that episode where he returns. Yeah. It's, I think a lot of the negativity towards Beryl is just that the actor isn't quite up to the level of complexity that the scripts give him a lot of the time. Mm. Like, he's kind of... Like, he's not terrible, but he's a little wooden. And... It does take away a little bit from what the potential might have been. And I think there's also just sort of like a shipper factor where mm -hmm. there's just a lot of people who want to see Kira with someone else. Whereas, yeah. honestly, I kind of feel like that was the healthiest relationship she had. Um, I agree. Uh, Odo, very much included. That aside, I just, I do find the ending a little frustrating in that I feel like it was a way to shoehorn the intendant in and sort of turned the last 15 minutes or so into a little bit more of a wacky caper than it needed hmm. to be. Like the tone shifts once she's there, which I feel doesn't work that well. But I do feel like in terms of just that finding deeper meaning and deeper potential in what the near universe can do, I do feel like it's a really successful episode. I mean, I know what you mean. Um, I did enjoy when she turned up because it's when you got the strongest mirror Kira trying to kiss herself <laughs> in some ways, like the most expressly like, yes, this is what she's trying to do. And it's true that it does turn something that's very tragic into something that has a bit more of a camp sensibility to it. But I don't know. I feel like Trek does that a lot and it didn't feel off pitch for it to be both tragic and campy. Um, and I do think that that ending is tragic. And like, there's all this stuff from, you know, the intendant about like all you can be. And then him sort of just being like, but I guess she's probably right. And I really do want to, know. I'd love to see something about like, yeah, what does happen when they get back to uh, the mirror universe after he's stunned her. It's also crazy that like, given how much he doesn't want to return to the mirror universe, that he does do that in the end. Like, I can see him, very much see him saying, I'm not good, I'm a thief, this is who I am. Even if I could have been better, I can't be better now. But then choosing to go back to the mirror universe, that either says that he has the world's lowest self-esteem or just something else really sad that he decided to do that when it was so clear how bad that world was for him. He should have just taken in the intended and run off somewhere else in the non mirror universe or something. And it's such a reversal of what, of the normal mirror universe arc dating all the way back to the original series, this whole idea of like people who think they can only be one way deciding actively to be better and to be more ambitious and to have this character say, this is all I am, I can't be more, it would have taken such tremendously different circumstances for me to be a better person, and it's just too late now. And But if you look at, like, Beryl Prime, he was also a character who in the end gave up. Yes, exactly. He was very <sighs> much like, yes, I guess I'll just die now. He's always been tragic. Yeah, that he just gets to be tragic over and over. Mm -hmm. And tragic yeah. in a way that I think male characters Characters very don't often. get to be. Yes, okay. I'm like, uh. That he's very <laughs> much, like if he were like a female character in a comic book, we'd be like, oh yeah, this shit again. That's so real. So like if Beryl's arc were a woman in a comic book, we'd be like, oh my God, this shit again. But because it's, a young, attractive white man twice saying basically like, 
and now I die so that the women can go be heroes and other women can go continue being villains. Your story can move forward. It's really different. And it's still different now. Like, it was pretty mind-blowing in the 90s, and it's still in 2022. It's like, we just don't see that this this, that often. Oh, that's why I think he's interesting. Thank you, Sarah. You have just opened my eyes to why I'm a fan of them. I thank you. That's such a for Ryle haters at the back. He is very interesting. Uh, oh he my is, god! But no, that's um, so he's real. A, he's a tragic feminist hero, and we all just need to <laughs> acknowledge that secretly, women who are attracted to men also just sort of want a a, a nice youth pastor or who's kind of made of cardboard. <laughs> Like, there's a part of that in all of us. Yeah, yeah. No, thank you. That's such a good insight about why he is a unique character here. There's lots of characters where in various ways we get a ton of insight into who they are. I feel like the fact that we keep getting Garrick over and over, in addition to the fact that Andy Robinson could not be having more fun. Mm -hmm. What do you see Mirror Garrick telling us about Prime Garrick? Okay, so let's just, just to be clear for listeners who might not remember this, in one of the Mirror episodes, I guess it's like the third one, Garrick is being held prisoner by the head of the Klingon Empire, who is Worf. He is literally on a chain and like metal collar, which is got to be really terrible on your dual spined neck. He's angry. He's trying to put all the blame on Kira. It's all very, you know, none of it, none of it's any surprise, but like, I, I'm just trying to think about like, how are we reading that exchange where he says to Worf, is there anything I can do for you? And Worf saying, you are not my type. And then him saying, neither are you. Was he trying to be the Kira that he like loves to hate? Was he saying that because he's like, well, maybe this will work. And then he's maybe secretly glad it doesn't because kind of heterosexual vibes. Or maybe he hates Kira all along because he wishes he could be a vampy femme fatale like her and he's jealous. He hates or... I don't buy like, heterosexual for anyone who hits on Worf that much. He, but you see what I mean about saying like, I, Garrick himself did not say like, please put me in this dog. <laughs> mirror, mirror Garrick did not ask to be... Uh, choked in a dog collar by Worf. But so like, what do we, what, what does it mean? This is my question for you. I, I don't know. I, I, I definitely read this hitting on Worf. <laughs> the story puts this, like Garrick didn't say, please put me in a chain and dog collar. That's, you know, like that's gay to the viewer. I don't think that that's gay to Garrick's experience of it. Does that, like, the context is sexual. It isn't necessarily him. I guess you have to view it maybe as being a comment on his hatred of Kira, that he is sort of, like, offering that and with such distaste that, like, maybe that that's where his mind is going to for things he could do. is like, because, you know, he hates, he, like, hates Kira. Maybe, like, he hates Kira because he wishes he could be Kira. I wonder if he's just sort of asexual. Mm. Like, he shows, for all of his, like, flirtatious energy in the Prime Universe, you know? Yeah. And not just geared towards Bashir. No. Like, he's got he's just sort like that. of... Yeah. Yeah. And because we have so much word of God from Andy Robinson, like, we know that that's something he built into the character. So I'm wondering if, like, Part of Mirror Garrick's difference from Prime Garrick is his lack of a sexuality. I, um, I'm trying to figure that out too. Is does it mean anything, or is it just an excuse to put two actors who don't get a lot of other shared screen time onto a set mm. together and just letting true. them be incredibly silly? Because That's true. honestly once Garrick and Worf are together, they're not really interacting with anyone else. It's almost like COVID filming levels of isolation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and it's they, true, they just don't get to off each other. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. they barely get any other screen time together. Like, they're just not characters that interact. And it's just fun to see them play off each other. I mean, I'm really intrigued now about the whole, like, is Garrick jealous of Mira and Kira, of the intendant, for being able to vamp it up? Where he, yes, this is my new theory as developed live on air. Part of why he hates Kira 
is because she gets to do the things that he really, really, really cannot do as a Cardassian man. Yeah. Whereas Prime Garrick, ha- like, either never gave a fuck or ha- is out of fucks and is therefore yes. like, I am just going to be, you know, the the Liberace of Cardassia. Yes. Because yeah. I have nothing to lose. Yeah. Whereas yeah, I mean, Mira Garrick has everything to lose everything to all lose. the time. Yes, exactly. He's already at the top, so he can't afford to be out, basically, is what his whole thing is saying. Um, and he's desperate. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He's yeah. afraid of losing status in a way that, again, like Garrick is no longer afraid of anything because mm-hmm. he's already lost everything. Yeah. Yeah. I know I, lo- I love it, and I I just feel like there's a piece of his hatred of her that is revulsion, and that revulsion, revulsion often comes comes revulsion is a feeling that comes from disgust. It's connected to shame. It's tied to which is tied to sexuality a lot. Yeah. So he's jealous of the intendant. I mean, it really is an amazing jumpsuit, one of the best costumes in uh ds9 i think so i mean whatever you want to say about the costuming you know the the jake cisco tops that look like bus seats and whatever like (laughs) (laughs) sorry is that a tumblr that is a like long-standing meme uh I mean, it's the kind of thing that Tumblr creates, but I have definitely seen it on Twitter. And Uh also, as it's like it's reached the point where, to me, like it's just fandom shorthand, where like even like the the Star Trek shit posting uh, Facebook group, which I am on because like that's where you get your memes now. um, Mm. The people creating Star Trek memes are all you know in their forties. Yeah, but like. Therefore, it's on Facebook. Um, But, like, it's just shorthand where sometimes, like, there will just be a picture of a bus seat and a Jake Sisko joke. (laughs) That's really amazing. Okay. Like, how many of my brethren had to die so that Jake Sisko could be clothed? That kind of thing. (laughs) Okay, sorry. But back, yes, to the point you were making about costuming on the show. Yeah, it is. I mean, there are the wigs are like their own footnote because yeah. I swear, um, Bashir, Dax, both Daxes, and there's got to be more. They were all wearing the same ratchet, um, what RuPaul would call a ratchet ass kitty wig. Mm hmm. Yeah. It is yeah. just, it's like they had a bunch of the same wig and they were like, these are horrible. Let's put them on the mirror universe characters. I mean, I sometimes choose to interpret people having bad costuming or hair or whatever as maybe being something that's a reflection of them and not just like looking at it as being an accident. But I I do think those are mostly accidents there. It's mostly just like, you know, hair, makeup, and costuming have a lot of work to do on Star Trek. And I think sometimes they just ran out of time. Yeah, like the one person, like, you know, the people who got upgrades, obviously, are Kira. And then I swear, like, the first time I was like, oh, Esri's cute was when I saw her, like, Joan jetting it up in that in that episode. Yeah. Because that's a good, because, like, that 70s mullet is a good look for her. And Joan Jett is the best look, really. So, yeah, there is there certainly a it. who wore it best in which she wins. Yeah. So that's really, well, she doesn't win against Joan, but she definitely wins against other Star Trek hair. Yeah. No, no, no. Joan is not in the running here. It's only people who are shown in the mirror universe. Yes. In the mirror universe, she might actually win. Um, Although if anybody wants to make us a mirror universe vid, um, too bad reputation. I mean, we wouldn't say no. We would say yes. We would thank you. And I would share yes. this for my popular Twitter we, yes, account. Yes, we would, we, would, we would share it. And others would see it. So, you know. Mm-hmm. Hey, listeners. Thank you, listeners. We do not have those skills. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, no. Uh, yeah. Um, although, you know, we, 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 I'm, it's interesting. Like, everybody's outfits in Mirror You from Smiley as soon as he's able to, like, have non-garbage clothing. Cisco. 
to um, Burial, they're all kind of like a little bit piratey and a little more Ren Faire than their outfits yeah. are. There's a lot of vests. World. So many vests. I um, mean, there were a lot of vests in the 90s. I was there, true. I wore them, but like... yeah. But they do feel it does feel like a style thing where they're saying like, and in the mirror universe we have beards and vests. Um, although you know, this <laughs> is something is they they don't have beards in this one. Why is that? Well, well, Bashir has sort of a five o'clock shadow, but I think yeah. it's just you know again like nobody wants to grow one, and like it takes makeup time to create one. So, I mean, yeah. Okay. I just feel like it's an important piece of it, of the lore to keep alive, you know? I agree. And I think all of them would look good with a beard, including Esri. Beards for everyone. Yeah. And you know, the la Zial never shows up either. So really, there is a total lack of beards. <laughs> Oh, okay. So should we talk about your question about who characters who notably never appear in the Mirror Universe? Sure. Does Mirror Jake exist? My feeling is, I mean, actually, I don't fucking know. Like, do people only exist when their parents are together? I don't see. My theory is that like there's like grand forces forcing like everybody who is born in one universe to be born in the other otherwise like the chances that all of these people would exist and have survived to adulthood are really slim so like my headcanon is that like jennifer secretly gave birth to jake and he has been like swirled away somewhere maybe it's oh. like a bajoran temple maybe it's like with his grandpa who knows but like jake exists and i was watching the jennifer cisco episode with like the does this work if you presuppose that she gave birth to Jake? And I'm like, it actually kind of works better. So I'm convinced of that, but there's no canon evidence except for my conviction that everybody also exists in the mirror universe. Okay. Okay, cool. I mean, and her, you know, her tenderness, I mean, she's just, you know, I feel like when I first saw that episode, um, as a person who really hates like anything that implies that like everybody has maternal instincts and wants to take care of a kid and that like suddenly being presented with not just a kid, but like your teenage kid would be like, hooray, I feel so momly. Like it upset me a lot. Much. But I feel like if she'd had that baby and given him away, mm -hmm. it would explain right. why she would be really excited it to see him. It would. I definitely would. It's a good explanation. I guess I just, I hate that that's such a common cultural assumption that any, it just feels like surely anyone would be so excited to see their alternate universe kid from a life in which they made a very different life choice. And uh, Oh, as somebody who still at the ripe old age of 43, like still has people going, so are you having kids? And I, like my answer now is like, if I'd wanted them, I would have one like right <laughs> it's, it's um yeah. so i yes my response to discovering i had a teenage child would not be excitement but i think i don't think it's out of place here yeah okay yeah okay. like i have a problem with the trope but i don't have a problem with this instance of it yeah it bothered me less this time maybe that was going on in my mind mirror keiko and molly and yoshi my goodness i mean i'm sure keiko exists but Will she ever they find do, Miles? I don't know, they man. They do develop her a bit in some of the um, novels. Hmm. Um, and basically do a sort of like, and she and, she and Miles O'Brien would fall in love in any universe kind of situation. Um, but I think that they could have done something cool with her. I'm sure that it was an actor scheduling issue because Rosalind Chow was, was one of the hardest to pin down. But it would have been interesting to see what they could have done with her, especially because she's got like that sass and that spark and that natural resistance to her that she would have made a really cool and interesting resistance fighter. Oh, interesting. Yeah, she would have enjoyed playing the hell out of that. As someone who doesn't really think those two should be married, that I kind of think their kids don't exist. But, you know, 
but I'm sure Keiko is still in that world being being an interesting person. One way or another, those children are, children exist because the mirror universe demands continuity. Um, I guess, yeah. No, I mean, there, there's kind of no way for them to unless Miles repeatedly hooked up with her and then just never saw her again. But, you know, it would have been cool to see Keiko. I think that that would have... And it, it, would have, have given, it would have been very cool. It would have given um, the actress something really fun to do. Um, I think she would have nailed it. I think she might have rivaled Esri for best use of the terrible wig. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Because surely they would have put her in that wig. Yes, I can totally imagine. Yeah. Um, so there's no Ducat in the Mirror Universe. I have a theory. Do it. He got killed by Garrick. Oh. Or the Intendant. Like I'm sure he existed. I just think he's been assassinated by that by that point or war because yeah or, yeah or wharf there's a whole lot of people who could have killed that motherfucker but um, i do feel strongly like he existed and he's just been assassinated and i like no that one theory. Him. um no nobody yeah, mourned I, like, that I wish we knew but like i like the theory that like ducat is dead yeah and like um, as a personality we don't need him because if you as you've mm-hmm. pointed out the intendant is all of the things we get from Ducat. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that could be another thing. Like maybe Kira killed him and took his place even. Maybe she, maybe part of why she's such an evil person is because like she saw being that as being the way that you control the space station. Maybe that's yeah, something she's that makes emulating. Sense. Yeah. Maybe she's And we have Ducat. no Kai Wynn. Right. And we have no Kai Win, yeah. Well, there's also, oh, that, I mm, hadn't thought about this until I rewatched the, the Burial episode just now, which is the Bajorans don't have the Bajoran religion in, in the Mirror universe. And so, you know, I certainly do not want to say that people who are atheists are not some of the most moral people. They absolutely are. But I think there could be a reading of it that perhaps part of, her being different is she didn't have faith to put herself into in this yeah, universe. And Amy and I were talking a bit about like who Kai Wynn would be in this universe. Mm. Um, and like we came up with a couple of different ones. We were sort of veering towards like really unpleasant middle manager type. Oh, yes. But like somebody who never achieves the rank that she thinks she deserves, but is kind of resigned to it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like that would have been an interesting way to go with it. I don't know. Do you think, uh, can you think of another use of Kai Wynn that would have been interesting? I would be curious if there was any world or any circumstances in which she wasn't a terrible psycho, power hungry, evil. Like what would it take for that to not be her, you know? Yeah, I mean, the only way for it not to be is if it's a gag that she's like the nicest lady there is because it's the mirror universe. What if she was that person who ha- is right and has good morals and is just deeply unpleasant to be around? That would be interesting. Yeah. And like, I would totally see her being the deeply unpleasant to be around person who's just very like stuck in the rules and overly reliant on robert's rules of order but like <laughs> maybe you know during like during organizing meetings she's just like way too into robert's rules of order and like that kind of thing but like she actually gets the work done maybe like it'd be kind yeah. of interesting to see her in that kind of position among the yeah. among the freedom fighters perhaps you know interesting yeah i uh, yeah it's like there were there's a lot of different potential there i'm not sure that the writers of this show being writers of this show would have picked up on any of those nuanced possibilities. Yeah. Um, I have a feeling she would have been a gag of some kind, but it still mm-hmm. would have been cool to see her. Yeah, totally. Who else do we miss? We haven't talked I about Jadzia, really. Yeah, we don't get enough of Jadzia. No. Does she know she's sleeping with other Cisco when she sleeps with other Cisco? Because I kind of think she does. I think she does. Yeah. The, uh, the show also is counting on us to know that she does. Because if she doesn't, that would be a bad look for real Cisco. Yeah, a bad look, like sexual assault bad look. Yeah. 
Um, and I don't know that the show thought that far ahead about it, but um, I think it's not unreasonable to think that she did know and was just doing it anyway because she was trying to like figure out what the fuck was going on and maybe you know like felt sad for missing her benjamin and so was like i will have sex with this man who looks like him yeah i always lean towards doing it anyway with agency being like now i get to have one last time i get to have closure yeah Yeah, totally i think Um, it was a very bad move psychologically on cisco's part to then go mm-hmm. back to his own universe and like have to go be friends with Jadzia forever but like you know oh you think like real man. cisco is like tormented by the fact that he did that i don't think he was tormented on by I it i think it's yeah. just sort of like the sci-fi version of like you get drunk and you sleep with your best friend realize it was a bad idea and try to go back to being best friends yeah like you just move on like i you know i don't yeah I mean, he does a very good job of it. Exactly. It's still never a good idea, but he moves on from it. I turned out okay. It's fine. Um, who else? <laughs> um, Just because it turns out okay doesn't mean it was a good idea. Mm. Um, <laughs> is there anybody else that we care about? I don't know. No, we, we don't like the, we, like the Vorda it. and all them. Like they're not a thing. We do hear a joke about like something being colder than the Breen. Um, so I guess yeah. they do exist. Like like most most of the other characters that don't like we don't see Damar, but like why would we? Yeah, he's like, not important at that point anyway. No. Um there's just anybody we don't see, like there's just no room for, I don't think. Yeah. Yeah. And that's okay. Like, you know, I there are definitely more stories that could be told with who we have and people who we want to have seen. Right. And because we do get a lot of people like we like Lita is a gag. Vic Fontaine is a gag. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We talked about bringing people back from the dead and resolving arcs. Just the thought with Jennifer Cisco that like I do think it was important that the show like did give us a Jennifer Cisco in a more deep and complex way than we saw her in non mirror universe, you know, because she was very much this is like this like woman in a picture. Um, like well, Laura Palmer kind of thing almost, right? Yeah. And then getting to finally have, even if it's not our Jennifer Cisco, a Jennifer Cisco taking a more active role in a story, it felt good to see that for that reason. Yeah. Yeah. It's. I feel like we get her twice. We get a lot of her. Mm. Uh, and it does really resolve her arc in a certain way. Yeah. Like, we get to know her as some kind of person. Yeah, exactly. exactly. So why do the Ferengi keep dying? Is it just a joke or is it, like, a thing? Do we have a theory behind this? I I feel like I should know this going into it. Are the Mirror Universe scripts written by the same people at any point? I'd have to look that up. I don't know. Because if they are, then maybe they find the Ferengi irritating. However, conversely... I think that if there is a meeting other than just like we, the writers find this them irritating and so we'll kill them. It might be that in a mirror universe, there isn't as much of an important space for people to occupy that sort of business trader intermediary role in that society because the totalitarianism is more global. And so they have less of, there's less of something resembling modern capitalism and therefore, but they're all less- pretty capitalist. Like all, yeah. like all of them. Like we see. To me, it's 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 sort of a clear case of like Quark died, and that made sense. And then the next one, it made sense narratively for Rom to die. And then by the third time, they were like, "Yeah, we just got to kill one off and everyone because now it's funny." Um, so then they kill Nog, and then the last one, like the Ferengi go to the mirror universe, and it's like just silly. Um, but like, so though for me, it is kind of a just silly, like it's a, it's a running gag. It does draw attention to like the sort of everybody kind of gets shot in this universe kind of situation. Dramatically, they have good dramatic deaths too. And I yeah. love reluctantly heroic qu- quark. I mean, one of the thing, you know, one of the other really like quark being a good person moments you get is in the Boreal episode when he like Quark is at, like real Quark, our prime Quark is at his most Quarkness when he's like considers trying to pull a scam with Boreal, realizes what else is really happening, 
complains to Kira about not being able to find his shipment and then like lays some truth on her that she didn't want to look at, but lays it on her in a really like crumbly way. And it was good advice and he was right. Quark is frequently right in the Prime universe too. I think it sort of highlights mm -hmm. that. That Quark is frequently wise and has excellent social skills. Yeah, he'd have to. Yeah, he'd have to. But like, and I think with Nog, like by that point, by the point where Mirror Nog shows up, we've kind of getting used. We've kind of gotten used to Nog being heroic, but he's still kind of a sexist creep. And yeah, like, I feel like seeing him in the Mirror Universe is a nice reminder that like, no. We've still got some issues with Nog. That's very true. That's very true. Like, we love the guy, but, like... He's got shit to work through, sure. He's got shit to... He's that one friend. Like, he's still a little bit that one friend. One of the things that, again, I keep thanking my wife because I she sat and watched all these episodes with me all day, um, so have lots of thoughts, was we've talked a little bit about how the Mirror Universe, um, the social structure on Tarek Noor resembles what the Cardassian occupation of Bajor might have looked like. Mm. Does it represent that, do you think? I think it's supposed to. I think it's, yes. I think that's the intent. Yeah. Because that's where else, why have it be ore processing? Mm -hmm. Like, ore processing in a space station is like, ridiculous in the first place so yeah. if you're going to keep doing if you're going to keep making that choice then you must be continuing to make that choice because you're saying this is a, something to compare between yeah it's i feel like it's at we've talked a little bit how it's got like a little bit of a casablanca feel oh yeah like it does it's one of the places where the analogy to world war ii actually does line up yeah um it's i feel like especially that first crossover episode does give us a vision of how occupation feels that there's a few episodes that achieve it necessary evil which is one of my favorite episodes of the whole series so good. yeah gives us that feeling um and they're both season two episodes that so that's the noir episode in case folks don't recognize yeah. the name that's the noir episode that takes place mostly in flashback to Odo's memories. Yeah. Yeah, with Odo narrating. Season two is a good place to give us a couple of episodes that give us a real picture of what the space station used to be like before it was a mall. Mm hmm Yeah. I'm, I'm looking forward to when we start, when we do an episode talking about the space itself, the station. Um, I think that'll be a really cool one from us. Yeah. It was an important thing for us to get this additional moment looking at it. And I also think some people probably needed to see a world in which humans were at the bottom of the uh, food chain, so to speak, in order to really understand it. Like, I think it's one of those, like, we will hit you over the head in case you are that dense moments that I don't regret the show doing, you know? Yeah. Sometimes, like, considering the amount of subtlety that many, many people have been pulling out of Deep Space Nine since it aired. The mm -hmm. fact that occasionally it is making sure that you get the point is not a bad thing. Yeah. I mean, I, I love when Jack Kirby does that. Like, there's moments where I really enjoy when something just hits you over the head of the fucking folding chair. Um, I mean, and I think, like, even, like, with the whole thing with Kira being gross to all her human slaves, it's, like, it, it's... It's important for people to see, you know, the Bajorans exoticizing the humans, you know? Yeah. And I we've touched on this before, that it's one of the really fascinating and really hard sci-fi things that's unique to Deep Space Nine in a lot of ways is how often it shows humans being treated as the aliens in the room. Yeah, totally. I almost feel like we need, in the same way that like we've had like Klingon episodes and whatever, I feel like we need a humans episode. Yeah, I, I'm into that. Let's do that. Let's talk about, is the mirror universe queer baiting or is it queer representation? It's tough to talk about this always because we know that Deep Space Nine was so constrained in what yeah. it was able to show. 
And yet they got away with a lot of it. In they got the away with so much more than most things. Yeah, I feel like, you know, it's, in some ways, I feel like it's probably not accurate to call anything queer baiting that takes place before the year 2000. You know, I think there's all kinds of shows that take place and all kinds of disgusting queer baiting, but like prior to that, like they weren't going to get to do it really anyway. So this was what you'd get. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's, I think that, yeah, like I feel like a lot of younger viewers who come to the show, not having been born yet. Yeah. <laughs> When the yeah. show originally aired, I think there's a tendency to be like, oh, Garrick and Bashir was queer baiting because there's not really an understanding that, no, you can't have queer baiting if none of the fans expect it to ever happen. Like, yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. They're not baiting yeah, us. When we there know was it nothing to fish for because, yep. like, I'm remembering the time when when this aired i'm remembering watching my so-called life and seeing like an actual queer person on my television mm -hmm. and being like oh my god they just did that they will never do that again like that was really yeah. the feeling they'll never let us do it again i mean i do think it's a legitimate question to ask like what does it mean that the only queer like the most expressly queer characters you get for like kira or like is when she's a villain. And, you know, I think that that is why the show was allowed to do it is because she's not the real Kira and the real Kira is a nice, wholesome, heterosexual <laughs> uh, person. Um, so, you know, but the, but the, but the evil one can be bisexual because we all know those bisexual people are shifty. Again, they do re redeem that a little bit in that last episode in the seventh season where we get Mira Esri and Mira Lita kissing. Yay. Yay. Um, I know. And I will note that in the tie-in novels, they get married. We do. I love it. We do. So, we do. I just, but I make fucking kill yeah. off Lita because we Mother cannot have nice things, but oh. they do let them be like together as a couple. In okay. I love that. For a but like, to be clear, when I'm saying that it's like going into a, a distrustful, sneaky bisexual trope, I would still rather have this than not have this. And I still enjoy her presence. And I'm not saying that you know, future comics or stories shouldn't have Mirror Kira be by. They should. They should just also have Prime Kira be by, you know? Yeah. Like, yeah, I'm not I feel that like any of this is like bad representation in the way that it's like harmful and shouldn't exist. It's just that it is playing into tropes that it would be better to just have more queer characters than just having that. That's all. Yeah. Oh, I, I agree. And I think that when we I know you do, it's just for the kids out there, you know. Yeah. <laughs> whenever we do look at this show, we are always looking at it like this is a show that is, you know, pushing 30 years old. Like um it was a different time and it's not that we can't wish that there were better queer rap, but we also know how slim the opportunities for queer rep were so it's never like we're giving we're making excuses for it we're all always just saying like we know that wasn't possible like we're mad that it wasn't possible it's really disappointing many many of the people involved in the show have gone on record saying how disappointing it was but yeah like it would be worse to not have uh mira kira be like a pansexual predator <laughs> yeah like because there's so much even like with a lot of recent media like representing like oh this person is villainous because they go after everybody but only of the opposite sex and they would never flirt with someone of the same sex because we something there there was some um, courage there and also like it's fun to just see her mm -hmm. interacting sensually with such a wide variety of people yeah it was hot and we didn't get that much and therefore we as baby queers enjoyed it um just a fact yeah and in an era where like 
just thinking about like Disney villains of the 90s and stuff, which she is very much built on. Like, at least they kind of went there. Whereas mm-hmm. there's so many other um, examples of 90, 80s and 90s queer coded villains where they don't even go there a little. That the fact that they go there somewhat is a little bit of an innovation. Mm-hmm. Definitely. So, next. We did have a question from a listener asking about whether the Mirror Universe is using queer theory. And as somebody who spent a lot of my academic life reading a lot of 90s queer theory, (laughs) um, that's not really what queer theory is, per se. But only insofar as in, like, it suggests that a lot of the characters in the prime universe that we perceive as performing heterosexuality, the mirror universe provides evidence that they are indeed only performing heterosexuality. Yes. That's good. Yeah. Like that's how I'd apply queer theory to it. I don't know if that's what you meant, but like to me thinking of like Judith Butler era queer theory, like that's how I'd apply those concepts. Mm-hmm. Uh, mirror universe is full of fridge logic problems. Really, like if you try to logic it out, just you know, go home. <laughs> like, don't try. <laughs> you end up head cannon- cannoning secret Jake Cisco baby, and like that's one of the ones that you can resolve through regressive head cannoning. Mm-hmm. What we had a listener notice that. Vic Fontaine shows up as a flesh and blood human and then gets killed, Um, Mm. which is a gag, but it's a gag that makes no sense. Yeah. I don't think I really considered it until they brought it up. Yeah. Do the prophets exist? And just like, they've never contacted Bajor because Bajor is too much of a shit show or like, do they not exist? And what does that say? And there's a whole thing where Enterprise establishes that probably the divergence between the two universes occurred at first contact with the Vulcans, Mm -hmm. except that Deep Space Nine makes a whole bunch of references to things from the past that happened before that that are already divergent. And one of the things would be if the prophets never contacted Bajor, that would have happened before the canon established divergence point. And now I sound like one of those guys on Reddit and I need to stop. (laughs) Yeah, but I think it's helpful. (laughs) Like you just, you like, when you ever, you try to logic certain things, like you end up in a cursed death spiral of trying to make your brain justify things that were clearly just done because they were funny. Yeah, and they were. And they worked. Like, do we really care whether Mira Jadzia is joined or not? Do we care? I mean, I think think it's interesting, but, like, given how little we have of her, of course we don't know. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, it matters, but we don't know. (laughs) I suspect she's not. For, for, For what it's worth, I suspect she's not. Yeah. Or maybe she is. Who knows? But I do feel like the more you think about the mirror universe on Deep Space Nine, the more you're like, none of this actually lines up from a rigorous sci-fi perspective. It only lines up from a like, this is incredibly entertaining television. Yeah. And I think at a certain point, you need to let things do that. Do you agree or or a problem? (laughs) I like the the description of let, I like the description of let things for that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this has been a ton of fun. I uh, am excited. We have so many good episodes lined up to record soon, including a guest visit from one of my favorite elected officials and a very high profile, amazing policy expert and a lawyer who you may know from the internet and um, a few other pieces that we're looking at doing as well. And of course, we'll continue to do some that are just the two of us going on and on because people seem to get a kick out of those. So. We appreciate that, guys. It's good to connect with my friend this way. So to keep up with us, you can always check on me on Twitter, where I am a little bit too much, E-L-A-N-A underscore Brooklyn. That's E-L-A-N-A underscore Brooklyn. And Sarah, where can folks find you? Oh, I'm 
I'm on Twitter a lot less than Alana wishes I were at Padasha, which is P-A-S underscore D-E-C-H-A-T. That is also my name on Letterboxd, where I am more active, but a little behind on logging my movies. So if you follow me soon, you might get a giant dump of all the stuff I've watched in the past month. I also write about film and figure skating intermittently on thefinersports.com. And of course, Graphic Policy Radio continues to be my podcast where you can come to hear interviews with comics artists, writers, creators, historians, and roundtables around comics adjacent media. I've got some great writers, including a bit of a star coming up very soon. Yeah, thank you so much for listening. And as Odo says, don't be that guy from Reddit. Just repeat yourself. It's just a show. And it was funny. (laughs) You should really just relax. Hey, thanks for watching the previous video from Graphic Policy Television. Just by watching, you help support our site. Thank you so much. Now, if you're watching these videos, you probably care about geeky things like movies, television, comic books, toys, games, video games, you name it. You can go and subscribe right now to our YouTube channel to stay in touch and catch all the new videos, or check out our website at graphicpolicy.com. There's a nice link on this end of the video. But as always, thank you for watching. Keep on rocking and keep it geeky.